Ashley Brock reading Nora Roberts' book, Inner Harbor, Chapter 2. Philip stood on the foredeck of the yet-to-be Christian Neptune's lady. He personally sweated out nearly 2,000 man-hours, sacred from design to finish slope. Her decks were gleaming teak, her bright work glittered in the yellow September sun. Bell decks at her cabin was a woodworker's pride. Cams, for the most part, Philip used glossy cabinets, were fashioned of natural wood, hard-fitted and custom design, with sleeping room for four close friends. She was sound, he thought. She was beautiful, aesthetically charming, with her fluid hull, glossy decks, and long water line. Ethan's early decision to to use the smooth lap method of planking had added hours to labor, but had produced a gem. The podiatrist, podiatrist from P D.C. was going to pay handsomely for every inch of her. Well, Ethan hands in pockets of his faded jeans, eyes squinting comfortably against the sun, left in an open-ended question. Phil ran a hand over the satin finish of the gold wing, an area he'd spent many sweaty hours sending a finish. She deserves a less cliché name. The owner's got more money than imagination. She takes the wind. Ethan's lip curved in one of his slow, serious smiles. Good Christ, she goes, Phil. When Cam and I tested it out, I was sure he was going to bring her back. I wasn't sure he was going to bring her back in. Wasn't sure I wanted him to. Philip rubbed a thumb over his chin. We got a friend in Baltimore who paints most of that stuff. Most of the stuff he does is strictly commercial for hotels and restaurants, but he does terrific stuff on the side. Every time he sells one, he bitches about it. Hates to let a canvas go. Didn't really understand how he felt until now. And she's our first, but not our last. Phil hadn't expected to feel so attached. The boat building business hadn't been his idea or his choose. choice. He liked to think his brothers had dragged him into it, told them it was insane, ridiculous, doomed to fail. Then, of course, he jumped in and negotiated for the rental of the building, applied for licenses, ordered the necessary utilities, utensils. During the construction of what was about to become Neptune's lady, he dug splinters out of his fingers, nerves burns from hot crystal night, soaked muscles that wept after hours of lifting planks and had not suffered in silence, but with this tangible result of long months of labor swaying gracefully under his feet, he had admitted it was all worth it. Now they were about to start all over again. You and Cam make some headway this week on the next project. We want to have the hole ready to turn the end of October. Ethan took out a bandana, metallically polished fingerprints off the gong. If we're going to go through that killer schedule you worked up, got a little bit more to do on this one, though. This one? I snarled Phil tipped down his wafers. Damn it, Ethan, you said she was ready to go. The owner's coming in to take her. I was about to go in and work up the last of the paperwork on her. Just one little detail. Well, just one little detail. I have to wait for Cam. What little detail? Impatient Philip tricks. The client's due here any minute. Won't take long. He's a nodded toward the cargo doors. So here's Cam now. She's too good for this Yahoo. Cam called out as he came down the narrow dock with a battering operator drill. I'm telling you, we should get the wives and kids and sell her off to Bimimi ourselves. She's good enough for the, she's good enough for the final draw he's going to give us today once he gives me that check. Certified check. He's captain. Bill Wayne still came stuff near me. When I get to be me, I don't want to see either of you. <laughs> He's just jealous because we've got women. Came told him. Here. He shoved the drill in the field's hand. What the hell am I supposed to do with this? Finisher. Granny Cam pulled a brass clint out of his back pocket. We saved the last piece for you. Yeah. Absurdly touched. Phil took the clink. Watched the wink in the sun. We started her together. He's important. Seemed only right. He goes on the starboard. Starboard. Phillips took the screws, Cam handed him, and bent over the markings on the rail. I figured we should celebrate after. Drill wheeled in his hand. I thought about a bottle of Dom. He said, racing the voice of the noise. I figured it'd be wasted on the two of you, so I've got three harps chilling down on the cooler. They would go well, he thought, with the little surprise he was having delivered later that day. It was nearly noon before the client had finished fussing over every inch of his new boat. Ethan had been like to take the man out for a shakedown sale before they loaded the slope onto his new trailer. From the dock, Phil watched the butter yellow sails. Client's choice filled with the wind. Ethan was right, he thought. She moved. Slope skipped. 
skimmed toward the waterfront, heeled in like a dream. He imagined the late summer tourists would stop to watch, point out the pretty boat to each other. There was, he thought, no better advertising. He'll run her aground the first time he sells her on his home. Camp's head from behind him. Sure, but he'll have fun. He gave him a slap on the I'll just go right up that bill of sale. The old brick building they rented and had modified for the boatyard didn't boost many amenities. The line share was vast open space with fluorescent lights hanging from the rafters. The windows were small and always seemed to be coated with dust. Power tools, lumber, equipment, gallons of Xboxy and varnish, and bottom paint were set up where they could be easily reached. The lofting platform was currently occupied by the bare skeleton of the hull for the custom-designed sports fisher that was their second job. The walls were pitted with brick and unfinished sheetrock. Up a steep flight of iron steps, stairs was a cramped, windowless room that served as the office. Despite its size and location, Philip had it meticulously organized. The metal desk might have been a flea market special, but it was scrubbed clean. On its surface was a month at a glance calendar, his old laptop computer, a wire in outbox, two line phone answering machine, and a lucid holder for pens and pencils. <sighs> Crowded him with the desk were two filing cabinets, a personal copier, and a plain paper fax. He settled in his chair and booted up the computer. The blinking light on the phone caught his eye. When he punched it for messages, he found two hang-ups and dismissed them. Within moments, he brought up the program he'd customized for the business and found himself grinning at the logo for boats by Quinn. They might be flying by the seat of their pants, he mused as he plugged in the data for sale, but it didn't have to look that way. Justify the high-grade paper as an advertising expense. Desktop Desktop publishing was second nature to him. Creating stationery receipts bills was simple enough. He simply insisted that they have class. He shot the job to the printer just as the phone rang. Boats by Quinn. There was hesitation, then the sound of the clean. Sorry, wrong number. The voice was muffled and female and quickly gone. No problem, sweetheart, Philip said to the dial tone as he plucked the printed bill of sale from the machine. There goes a happy man. Camp coming in an hour later when the three of them watched their client drive off with their trailered slope. We're happier. Philip took the check out of his pocket and held it out. Factoring in equipment, labor, overhead, supplies. He pulled the check and half again. Well, we cleared enough to get by. Try to control your enthusiasm, came on. You got a check for five figures in your hot little hand. Let's crack open those beers. The bulk of the profits have to go right back into the business. Phil formed as they started inside. Once the cold weather hits, our utility bill is going to go through the roof. He glanced up at the storage, literally, and we've got quarterly taxes due next week. Cam twisted the top off a bottle, pushed it out of his room. Shut up, Phil. However, Philip continued on. This is a fine moment in Quinn history. He lifted his beer, tapped the bottle to both cans beneath. To our foot doctor, the first of many happy clients, may he sail clean and heal many bunions. May he tell all his friends to call boats by Quinn. Cam added, May he sail in and pull this and keep out of my part of the bay. <laughs> He's finished with the chicken with it. Who's bringing for lunch? Came one of them. I'm starving. Grace made sandwiches. He was all around my cooler. God bless her. <laughs> Might want to put off lunch just a bit. Philip heard the sound of tires and girl. I think what I've been waiting for just got here. He strolled out, pleased to see the delivery truck. Driver leaned out on the window. Worked a wad of gum and he Quinn. That's right. What'd you buy now? Cap frowned at the truck, wondering how much of this brand new check was flying away. Something we need. He's going to need a hand with it. He got that right. The driver hoof is climbing up. Took three of us to load her up. Son of a bitch weighs 200 pounds if it weighs an ounce. He opened the back door. He lay on the bed on top of a padded cloth. It was easily 10 feet long, six high, and three inches thick. Carved in simple block letters into treated oak wood were the words Bose by Quinn. A detailed image of a wooden skiff and full sail rode the top corner. Lying in the bottom corner was the names Cameron, Ethan, Ethan Philip. Says Quinn. That's a damn fine sign. Ethan managed, but he can find the words. I took one of Seth's sketches for the skiff, the same one we used for the logo on the letterhead. Put the design together on the computer work. Philip reached in and run a thumb along the side of the sign company, did a pretty good 
job of reproducing it. It's great. Cameras and hand feels one of the details we've been missing. Christ, the kid's going to flip when he sees it. But put us down the way we came along. Works out alphabetically and chronologically. I wanted to keep it clean and simple. He stooped. He stepped back. His hand sliding into his pockets in an unconscious mirroring of his brother's hands. I thought this fit the building and what we're doing in it. That's good. He's not. He's right. Driver shoved his gum up again. Well, you guys gonna mire it all day or you want me to get this heavy bastard out of the truck? They made a picture, she thought. Three accessories specimens of the male species engaged in manual labor on a warm afternoon in early September. The building certainly suited them. It was rough. The old brick faded and pitted. The grounds around it scrabbly, more weeds than grass. Three different looks as well. One of the men was dark, with his hair long enough to pull back in a short ponytail. His jeans were black, faded gray. There was something vaguely European about his style. She decided he would be Cameron Quinn, the one who'd made a name for himself on the racing circuit. Second wore scuffed work boots that looked ancient. His sun streaked hair tumbled out of a blue billed ball cap. He moved fluently and lifted his end of the sign with no visible effort. He would be Ethan Quinn, the waterman, which meant the third man was Philip Quinn, the advertising executive who worked at the top firm in Baltimore. He looked glilded, she thought. Wafers and Levi, she mused. Bronze hair that must be a joy to his stylist. A long, trim body that must be regular workouts at the health club interestingly interesting physically they bore no resemblance to each other and th through her research she knew they shared a name but not blood yet there was something in the body language and the way they moved as a team that indicated they were brothers she intended simple to pass she intended simply to pass by to give the b building where they based their business a quick look and evaluation though she known that at least one of them would be there since he answered the phone, she hadn't expected to see them outside as a group to have this opportunity to study them. She was a woman who appreciated the unexpected. Nerves shimmied in her stomach. Out of habit, she took three slow breaths and rolled her shoulders to relax him. Casual, she reminded herself. There was nothing to be uneasy about. After all, she had the vantage here. She knew them, and they didn't know her. It was a typical behavior, she decided as she crossed the street. A person strolling along and seeing three men working to hang an impressive new sign would display courage, deceit, and interest, particularly a small-town tourist, which was, for this purpose, what she was. She was also single female, and they were three very attractive men. A mild flirtation would be typical as well. Still, when she reached the front of the building, she stood back. It seemed to be difficult and precocious precautious work. The sign was bolted to thick black chains and wrapped in rope. They worked out a pulley system with the ad exec on the roof guiding and his brothers on the ground hauling. Encouraging encouragement curses and directions were issued with equal enthusiasm. There were certainly a lot of muscles rippling, she observed with a lift of her brow. You're in, Cam. Give me another inch. God damn. Grunt and Philip dropped onto his belly and squirmed out far enough that she held her breath and waited for gravity to do its work. But he managed to balance himself and snag the, ca the chain. She could see his mouth working as he fought to loop the heavy link around a thick hook, but she couldn't hear what he was saying. She thought that might be for the best. Got it. Hold it steady. He ordered rising to the tight walk. His way across the eaves to the other end. The sun struck his hair, gleaming over her skin. She got herself googling. This, she thought, was a prime example of sheer male beauty. Then he was belly over the edge again, grabbing for the chain, hauling it into place, and swearing ripenly. When he rose, he scrawled his long tear down the front of his shirt, where she supposed to had caught on something. On her. I just bought this sucker. It was real bloody too. Cam caught up. Kiss my ass, Philip suggested, and took the shirt off to use it to mop sweat off his face. Oh, well now, she thought, appreciating the view of a purely physical level, personal level. The young American god, she described, decided, designed to make females Joe. He hooked the ruined shirt in his back pocket, started for the ladder. And that's when he spotted her. She couldn't see his eyes, but she could tell by the momentary pause, the angle of the head, that he was looking at her. The evaluation would be insistent, instinctive. She knew male sees female, studies, considers, decides. He'd seen her all right, and as he stared down, started down the ladder, he was already considering it, hoping for a closer look. We've got company, Philip murmured, and Cam glanced over his shoulder. Hmm, very nice. 
Been there 10 minutes. He's in dust his hand on his hip. Watching the show. Philip stepped off the ladder, turned a smile. So, he called out, how's it look? Curtain, curtained up. She thought and started for it. Very impressive. I hope you don't mind the audience. I couldn't resist. <laughs> Not at all. It was a big day for the Queens. He held a hand. I'm Philip. I'm Sibyl. And you build boats. That's what the sign says. That's fascinating. I'm spending some time in the area. I hadn't expected to stumble across boat builders. What sort of boats do you build? Wooden sailing vessels. Really? She turned her easy smile towards her brother. And your partners? Cam. Cam. He returned a smile to my brother Ethan. Nice to meet you, Cameron. She began to shift her gaze to read from the sign. Ethan. Philip. Her heartbeat accelerated, but she kept a flat smile in place. Where's Seth? In school. Phil's home. Oh, college. Middle. He's ten. I see. There were scars on his chest, she saw now. Old and shiny and riding dangerously close to his heart. You have a very impressive sign, boats by Quinn. I'd love to drop by sometime and see you and your brothers at work. Any time. How long are you staying in St. Chris? Depends. It was nice to meet y'all. Time to retreat, she decided. Her throat was dry, her pulse was unsteady. Good work with your boats. Good luck with your boats. Drop by tomorrow, Phil suggested as she walked. Catch all four Quinns at work. She shot a look over her shoulder that she hoped revealed nothing more than amused interest. I might just do that. Seth, she thought, careful now. Keep her eyes straight ahead. He'd just given her the open door to see Seth the following day. Cam gave quite a, a quiet mail home. I gotta say, there's a woman who knows how to walk. Yes, indeed. Phil hooked his hands in his pockets and enjoyed the view. Slim hips and slender legs and a breezy, maize-collared slacks, a snug little shirt, the color of limes tucked into a narrow waist, slick and swinging fall of mink-collared hair, just skimming shoulders, strong shoulders. The face had been just an attractive class classic oval with peaches and cream skin, a mobile and sharp Shapely mouth tinted with a soft, soft pink. Sexy eyebrows, he mused, dark and well arched. He hadn't been able to see the eyes under them, not through the trendy, wired frame sunglasses. They may be dark to match the hair, or light for contrast. That smooth, cutterial voice had set the whole package off nicely. You guys gonna stand there watching that woman's butt all day? He's the one to know. Yeah, like you didn't notice it, Kim's. I notice. I'm just not making a career out of it. Are we going to get anything done around here? In a minute. Philip murmured, smiling to himself. When she turned the corner and disappeared. So, Bill, I sure hope you hang around St. Chris for a while. She didn't know how long she would stay. Her time was her own. She could work where she chose. And for now, she chose in this little water town on Maryland's southern eastern shore. Nearly all her life had been spent in cities and she initially because her parents had preferred them and then because she had new york boston chicago paris london milan she understood the urban landscape and its inhabitants the fact was dr sibyl griffin had made a career out of the study of urban life she gathered degrees in anthropology sociology and psychology along the way four years at harvard postgrad work at oxford a doctrine from columbia she thrived in academia now six months before her thirtieth birthday she could write her own ticket which was precisely what she chosen to do for a living right her first book urban landscape had been well received earned her critically acclaimed and a modest income but her second familiar strangers had rocketed her onto the nationals list and taking her into the whirlwind of book tours, lectures, talk shows. Now that PBS was producing a documented series based on her observations and series of city life and customs, she was much more than financially secure. She was independent. Her publisher had been open to her idea of a book of the dynamics and traditions of small towns. Initially, she considered it merely a cover, an excuse to travel to St. Christopher's to spend time there on personal business. But then she began to think it through. It would make an interesting study after after all, she was a trained observer and skilled at documenting those observations. Work might save her nerves in any case, she considered, pacing her pretty little hotel suite. Certainly, it would be easier and more productive to approach this entire trip as a kind of project. She needed time, objectivity, and access to the subjects involved. Thanks, for, thanks to convenient circumstances, it appeared she had all three now. 
stepped out onto the two-foot slab that the hotel loftily called a terrace. It offered a stunning view of the Chesapeake Bay and intriguing glimpses of life on the waterfront. Although she watched workboats clung into dock and unload tanks of the blue crabs the area was famous for, she watched the crab pickers at work, the sweep of galls, the flight of arrogates, but she had yet to wander into any of the little shops. She wasn't in St. Chris for souvenirs. Perhaps she would drag a table near the window and work with that view. When the breeze was right, she could catch snippets of voices, a slower, more fluid dialect than she heard on the streets of New York, where she based herself for the last few years. Not quite, not quite southern, she thought, such as you would hear in Atlanta or Mobile or Charleston, but a long way from the clipped tones and hard consistences consonants of the north on some sunny afternoon she could sit on one of the little iron benches that doted the waterfront and watch the little world that had formed here out of water and fish and human sweat she would see how a small community of people like this based on the bay and on tourists interacts what traditions what habits what cliches ran through them styles she mused or dress movements of speech inhibited inhabitants so rarely realized how they conformed to unspoken rules of behavior dictated by place rules 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 they existed everywhere sibyl believed in them absolutely what rules did the quins live by she wondered what type of glue had fastened them into a family they would of course have their own codes their own short speak with a pecking order and a reward and discipline standard where and how would seth fit into it finding out discreetly was a priority there was no reason for the quins to know who she was to suspect her connection it would be better for all parties if no one knew otherwise they would be very well Otherwise, they could very well attempt and possibly succeed in blocking her from Seth altogether. He'd been with them for months now. She couldn't be sure what he'd been told, what spin that might have been put on the circumstances. She needed to observe, to study, to consider, and to judge. Then she would act. She would not be pressured, she told herself. She would not be made to feel guilty or responsible. She would take her time. After the meeting that afternoon, she thought it would be ridiculously simple to get to know the quins all she had to do was wander into that big brick building and show an interest in the process of creating a wooden sailboat philip quinn would be her entree he displayed all the typical behavior and patterns of early stage attraction wouldn't be a hardship to take advantage of that since he only spent a few days a week in st chris there was little danger of taking a casual flirtation into serious territory wrangling an invitation to his home here wouldn't present a problem she needed to see where and how seth was leaving and who was in charge of his welfare was he happy gloria had said they'd stolen her son that they'd used their influence and their money to snatch him away but gloria was a liar so bill squeezed her eyes shut struggling to be calm to be objective not to be hurt yes gloria was a liar she thought again a user but she was also seth's mother going to the desk Sibyl opened her file fax and slid the photograph out a little boy with straw colored hair and bright blue eyes smiled at her she's taking a picture herself the first and only time she'd seen seth he must have been four she thought now philip had said he was ten now Sibyl remembered it had been six years since gloria showed up on her doorstep in new york with her son in tow she'd been she'd been desperate of course broke furious weeping begging there'd been no choice but to take her in not with the child staring up with those huge haunted eyes bill hadn't known anything about the ch about children she'd never been around them perhaps that was why she'd fallen for seth so quickly and so hard and when she come home three weeks later and found them gone along with all the cash in the house her jewelry and her prize collection of dome china she'd been devastated she should have expected it she told herself now it had been classic gloria behavior but she believed had na needed to believe that there could finally that they could finally connect that the child would make a difference that she could help well this time she thought if she took the photo away again she would be more careful less emotional she knew that gloria was telling at least part of the truth this time whatever she did from this point on would determine her own judgment she was began to judge when she saw her nephew again sitting she turned on her laptop and began to write her initial notes 
twin brothers appear to have an easy male pattern relationship. From my single observation, I would suspect they work together well. It will take additional study to determine what function each provides in this business partnership and in their familiar relations. Both Cameron and Eastwin Quinn are newly married. It will be necessary to meet their wives to understand the dynamics of this family. Logically, one of them will represent the mother figure. Since Cameron Weiss and Spinelli Quinn is a full-time career, one would suspect the Grace Monroe Quinn fulfills this function. However, it's a mistake to generalize such matters, and this will require personal observation. I find it telling that the business sign the Quinns hung this afternoon contains Seth's name, but as a Quinn, I can't say if this disposes of his legal name is for their benefit or his. The boy must certainly be aware that the Quinns are filing for custody. Can't say as yet whether he has received any of the letters Gloria has written him. Perhaps the Quinns have disposed of them. Though I sympathize with her plight and her dis desperation to get her child back, it's best that she remains unaware that I've come here. Once I've documented my findings, I'll contact her. If there's a legal battle in the future, it's best to approach the matter with facts rather than raw emotion. Hopefully the lawyer Gloria has engaged will contact the Quins through the proper legal channel shortly. For myself, I hope to see Seth tomorrow and gain some insight into the situation. It would be helpful to determine how much he knows about his parentage. As I have only recently become fully informed, I've not yet completely assimilated all the facts and their repercussions. We will soon see, soon see if small towns are indeed a hotbed of information or their inhabitants. I intend to learn all I can learn about Professor Raymond Quinn before I'm done. End of chapter 2